Have you ever wondered what it takes for a business to successfully cross language barriers and thrive in global markets? Well, in this episode today, we're going to be delving into the transformative world of AI-driven translation and localization. Because joining me today is my special guest, Brian Murphy, CEO of a company called Smartling, which is a company at the forefront of this revolution. And Smartling isn't just any translation service. I know there's a lot out there. This is an enterprise class language AI platform recognized as a leader in translation management systems. So today we're going to explore the challenges companies face when entering new markets, how AI can help leap over translation hurdles and so much more because Brian's going to shed light on how Smartling's innovative approach has empowered global giants from Canva to Pinterest and so many more and help them connect with millions of non-English speaking users. Before we get today's guest on though, I need, I need to give a quick shout out and a thank you to the sponsors of Tech Talks Daily this month. They are KiteWorks and in a digital age where the landscape of remote work is ever expanding, the security and efficiency of your managed file transfer solution are paramount. This is where KiteWorks sets a new benchmark, far surpassing legacy MFT tools with its unparalleled security measures and user-centric design. They've even been awarded the prestigious FedRAMP Moderate Authorization, a recognition that is not easily obtained, and they've held it since 2017 by the Department of Defence. So what I'm trying to say here is, don't let outdated technology dictate the safety and efficiency of your business operations. And you can start your journey towards uncompromised security and unparalleled functionality today by visiting KiteWorks.com. That's KiteWorks.com, where you can explore the future of secure data management. But now it's time to get on with the show and invite today's guest on. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to the US, where Brian's waiting to share his story. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Brian. Can you tell everyone watching a little about who you are and what you do? Sure, appreciate it. Hey, Neil. My name is Brian Murphy, and I'm the CEO of Smartling. And Smartling is a language AI company, and we help companies like Apple, Tesla, Disney, IBM to create multilingual digital experiences for their customers. And I've been building... SaaS and e-commerce companies for over 20 years now in a variety of industries. Fortunate uh, enough to work on a handful with a handful of companies um, as an investor and director. And my passion really is to create companies that change the status quo and deliver great outcomes for customers. Well, one of the things I say on every episode of this podcast is technology works best when it brings people together. And I know this is something close to your heart too, and this isn't your first rodeo. And I'm curious, what are the main challenges that companies face when entering new markets, particularly with things like language barriers? And and how are AI-driven translation solutions helping overcome some of these hurdles too? Yeah, it's it's a great question. We, you know, most Series C in particular, or Series C and beyond companies, you know, they get asked by the board uh, to go global, right? To expand their uh, to expand their markets to drive growth. And um, going global is is hard. It's complicated and it's expensive. And so, one of the things that we try to do is to take that pain point away from that part of the process. And it's really, you know, I always start with the customer, right? So, eighty seven percent of customers prefer content in their own language. And that's where it makes sense, doesn't it? Right. So if I was interested in a pair of German sneakers, um, I would go. I, you know, I would be interested in learning about those sneakers, but I don't speak German, so uh, I would prefer it if the content was in English. And as English speakers, we tend sometimes we forget about that because so much of the world does speak English. If they don't speak English, they don't necessarily prefer to speak English. So uh, we know that uh, studies will tell us eighty-seven percent prefer content now. How do they do that, right? So traditionally, for the past thirty years or so, the the traditional way of translating content is uh, time consuming, very manual, and expensive, and it's a pain. I've been doing this for like building multilingual websites for like twenty years. Um, Smartling Smartlink's language AI platform addresses those pain points uh, by providing a translation management platform that eliminates manual tasks by automating automating and managing. Uh, translational workflows and integrating into your existing tech stack, and B reduces the cost of translation by up to sixty percent by using AI and delivering extremely high quality translation. So 
global expansion is difficult in and of itself. We try and take at least take away at least some of that pain. And obviously, we're a few minutes into a tech podcast. We've already mentioned the AI word. And one of the things I try and do on these podcasts is you try and get people thinking beyond the hype, beyond the buzzword status, and talk about some of the problems that we're solving, some of the business value that it can help generate. So in your experience, how can companies effectively use AI-driven translation tools for localization purposes? And also, what are some of the key benefits of that approach in terms of scaling globally, uh, going global, of course? When you're when you're going global, right, you're looking to use and you're looking to, to, to be multilingual, to have multilingual digital experiences, right? You, you're going to want to use or you can use effectively uh, AI driven translation, uh, really in three primary areas. Number one is uh, your website, right? So you're going to start with your website. You want to have like your landing pages, your blogs, your help center um, printed uh, or in a multi or in a uh, local language, uh, lo- localized for the local language, right? Uh, number two, you're going to want to do marketing, your marketing communication. So your emails, et cetera, um, those. You'll, you're going to want to have localized. And then the product itself, right? So if it's a software product, have it in the local language. That's probably the most, one of the, I think our customers find that to be the most challenging or in-depth because you're actually getting into code. But we try to make that a little easier by by uh, by exposing an API that's pretty easy to use. And I think that, once again, you know, you, you find yourself, you're going to hear me talking about um, digital footprint, right? And one of the things I've learned, uh, whether it's B2B or B2C, is the digital footprint matters, right? So you think about if you think about your home country, right? Your digital footprint is probably pretty big, right? The size of your website, the blogs, the SEO articles, everything you've got, you you have a very large presence online, and that creates a great experience for your customers, and it also helps with getting new customers, particularly with SEO. When you go to, let's say, you're now now starting to expand to Japan or France or Germany, how big is your digital footprint there? I bet it's significantly smaller which makes it harder to create a great customer experience and to compete. So that's where traditionally it was too expensive for companies to create equally large or significant digital footprints in their target countries. That's the big advantage of language AI is that it takes that cost down to the point where there's tremendous ROI. And that's and that's how we that's how we help create a competitive advantage and a digital moat uh, for our customers. And before you came on the podcast today, I was doing a little research on you. And I quickly learned this morning, as we're with some pretty big brands from Canva to Pinterest, to name a few, and you've helped them reach non-English speaking users. So just to bring to life everything that we've just talked about it, can you share any insights into some of those collaborations and the ultimate impact of your services on their global reach? Sure, be happy to. Yeah, so Canva is a great company, great brand and a great ex- example of uh, going global first. And I'll explain what that means. So global expansion has, has been a key to their rapid growth. I think they've got at least, I, I don't know, the last time I checked, over 135 million users in 190 countries. Over half of their users are non-English speakers. They would they'd never have been able to add that many users as quickly and effectively without localized content. But one of the things that they did and what they're particularly good at is incorporating localization into the design process early, right? So thinking about that ahead of time, as opposed to coming back after the fact and trying to retrofit content um, in, a, in, in a localized way. So as a result, they were able to create great, uh, great experiences, localized experiences right out of the chute. Um, and to accelerate development velocity and deliver um, great localized customer experiences at scale. So I think that what they did right was was thinking about localization, translation and localization early on in the design process. Incredibly cool what you're doing here. And if we were to look under the hood at, at the mo- uh, for a moment, especially on behalf of everybody listening, business leaders from various uh, industries, what are some of the latest advancements in Smartlings language AI platform that, that make it a little bit different, unique, stand out uh, in this often crowded market of translation management systems? Yeah, I tell you what, this last year has been, I can't believe it's been a year, uh, a little bit, uh, you know, a year since OpenAI came out, yeah. right? And Jackie he hit the scene. And uh, what, actually, one of the reasons going back, I've been with Smartling, I'm in my third year now, but one of the reasons why um, we invested in uh, Smartling in the first place. Was Smarling had uh, was one of the 
early leaders of technology in translation localization. They had a you know a native SaaS, a multi tenant experience, uh, which was which was rare uh, in this space, and had really great capabilities at machine learning um, and neural machine translation. So my thinking on this was that you know eventually software eats the world. And this software would eat the, tra- you know, provide such a great value would would eat the fifty billion dollar translation and localization services business, which is largely, you know, what, what you think about it. it's a services professional services businesses with translators, etc. But we thought smartly would would do well there. What we didn't anticipate was the advent of Gen AI and its impact. And last February, when that hit, that was the key to our unlock. Like we we saw that as solving some fundamental problems that were really difficult for us to solve in terms of taking n- neural machine translation, which was pretty good and getting better, but had some problems with it, particularly around fluency and, and er- uh, fluency and errors. Gen AI combined with that was, was, once again, was the unlock. So what we were able to do is combining our automation, our translation automation capabilities our multi-engine neural machine translation capabilities combined with machine learning. And then with Gen AI, we're we are now able to deliver human quality translation. So in other words, qu- the quality of translation that's on parity with traditional uh, human linguists at half the cost and in half the time, right? And that's just V1, right? So we've been doing that at scale now for the past several, few months. And I see that... Um, and we'll talk more about cloud store or, or should data storage and things, but I see that radically accelerating. Um, and by pairing this AI, this Gen AI, Gen AI capability with those tools and with expert translators, we're able to eliminate a significant amount of time, uh, uh, amount of time consuming work uh, that they would be doing that would not particularly value add and allow them to be significantly more productive. So that's what we're really excited about. That's where we are right now. So this 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 revolution of AI powered translation, AI powered human translation, is for sure the thing that is rapidly accelerating and transforming this fifty billion dollar industry. And I'm curious, when you're working with AI translation, how do you get that balance between speed and translation, and, and get that necessity of maintaining high quality culturally relevant content because i would imagine we've all read about the hallucinations and things and if you if you hurry something out and it's not checked properly it can cause more harm than good so how do you get that balance right is it a tricky uh, to achieve that balance it uh it is and that's where um machine learning uh really comes into play um what what else that we do so there's there's three types of translation modes in effect today, basically. There's a neural machine translate AI powered neural machine translation, which is available in milliseconds, right? Um, but obviously you don't have time to do to have a human review of that. And customer uh you or use cases of that are typically, you know, customer service, you might imagine. So I'm on a I'm on a chat with a customer and I'm Polish and the customer's Japanese and I'm using machine translation essentially to allow us to communicate. Right. And that's that's super powerful. Um, but it doesn't have, you know, we've got quality control um, pers- uh, dimensions in place there, but it doesn't have a human review. So it's it has the potential to be um, accurate, but not great. Right. In terms of fluency, et cetera. Um, the next uh, step up from that is AI powered human translation, which delivers uh, the highest level of quality and takes about a day to turn around. Right, that's about the speed of which, and then there's traditional human translation or transcreation, and that takes about two days to turn around at a minimum. So that kind of gives you a sense of like the balance, right? So we can achieve very, very high quality uh, in milliseconds, but if you need that extra little step that you would use for a landing page or some website copy or marketing communications, then it's about a day, and that's still about the half the time of traditional human translation. And I think for the large part, most businesses know what they need to do. They need. Uh, what they want to do, what they want to achieve, what goals they want to unlock, all that stuff. But knowing where to start, that often gets quite intimidating, daunting, and overwhelming. So in your experience, are there any differences in how B2B and B2C brands should approach AI-driven translation and localization? And are you able to provide maybe one example for each just to 
uh, help anyone listening understand how it would work in their world? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I, I've been fortunate enough to do both B2B and B2C. And so in, in my time uh, as, a, as an executive at uh, eBay, I was able to do both at the same time. I used to joke in the morning, I would wear my, my B2B hat and I was going out and trying to bring on sellers, right? And in the afternoon, I was wearing my B2C hat and, and, and building uh, functionality for uh, for you know consumers looking to buy on eBay. So that was a really great experience in learning how to talk to both types of customers. Um, and I would say that the commonality is really around brand voice, right? So brand voice is really important whether you're B two B or B two C. Uh, and so I'll get for example, um, you know, B two B companies tend to have a little bit more of a professional or serious tone to their brand voice, where uh, B two C companies might have a little bit more uh, friendly or playful sort of brand voice. Um, but regardless of whether your your brand voice um, is is you know b- you know playful or serious, consistency is really important, right? So most companies have brand guidelines, et cetera. And you have specific nomenclature. How do you name your products? How do you call how do you refer to things, right? All that's relatively e- uh, simple, like if you're thinking about it, and like one language in English, like it's like, okay, I came up with this phrase and I just need to think about it that way. But if you're going back to the example of Canva working in 190 countries, it gets incredibly complex um, to localize all of that, very, that A, that tonality, those brand guidelines, that specific nomenclature it becomes almost a little bit overwhelming. And particularly, it's particularly a problem for traditional translation, right? Has a tough time doing this because you can imagine once again, having to train a global network of dozens or hundreds of translators on your company's specific brand voice, right? Like that's tough to do. So one of the really cool things that we're doing with language AI is training and customize the AI to produce your company's specific and consistent brand voice, which enables companies to communicate in a consistent brand voice, no matter what region or language they're localizing to. So you can imagine like, uh, there's we have a concept called translation memory, where once we've translated it once, it locks it in, it doesn't change anymore. We have glossary, we have style guide, et cetera. And all these things are baked in so that the the AI is actually quite good at producing very, very, in fact, I would argue better than um, a network of 100 independent uh, linguists around the world, but has a, but is very, very good at creating consistent brand voice. So I, I would say that whether you're B2B or B2C, I think that brand voice, in my opinion, um, and consistency of delivering that in a localized way is really important. And language AI is one of the, one of, really one of the best tools I've seen in a long time to do that. And as someone right in the heart of this space, as we continue forward down this path, how do you see AI technology evolving in the field of translation and localization? And, any impact you think this might have on global business strategies as we continue to move forward? Anything or anything that excites you as we progress down this path? Yeah, I do. Um, so today, companies are rational, right? And as a result, they they ration translation due to its cost and its effort, right? It's expensive. The 20 cents, a, you know, 18, 20 cents a word, which is sort of like the rack rate out there and the amount of manual effort, all that kind of stuff. It takes a lot of people, it takes a lot of dollars. So they ration translation. Um, like we used to ration data storage, right? Remember when we used to think about, mm-hmm. okay, I, I got to delete a whole bunch of files because I'm about to go over my limit. It's going to cost me more, right? So as, as we talked a little about earlier, we in my experience, uh, digital footprint matters, right? So having that large ex- custom, digital footprint and customer experience in France, in Germany, in Japan, is a competitive advantage if you can be in the past afford to do it, right? So the larger your digital footprint is, the the better your growth flywheel spins. Um, and so what's happening, I think what is happening and will happen more is that companies that are able to maximize their global digital footprint efficiently will win. And our mission is to help them do that. So as we bring down the cost of translation with AI, like we're doing, um, it's going to make it uh, more and more ubiqu- ubiquitous. The same way that today, like when was the last time like you went in and deleted a bunch of files because you're running low on storage? Like the cost has come down so much, you just don't even think about it. It's become ubiquitous. It's a service. 
And uh, I think that that's, that's the mission that we're on with translation and localization. And I suspect there'll be many people listening all around the world and setting off a few light bulb moments here. And maybe people will be going into the office, talking to their IT director about what they should be doing. What advice would you give to a business leader looking to expand into new linguistically diverse markets? And, and how should they integrate AI-driven translation into their strategy? I would imagine to begin with the problem and then build out, but can you expand on that just to help anyone listening? There's a number of different globalization strategies. Like there's there's probably five or six different ways to globalize a company, right? And a lot of it depends on the stage of growth that you're in, what your goals are, and what sort of resources you have available. So um, there's a number of those. We actually have a number of uh, examples of that on our website. Folks are interested in going and taking a look. Um, but the one thing that you do need to get right as a company and as a senior executive is that you need to hire a team that has a global mindset, right? This is really important because once it, it all does come down to people and strategy. So hiring a team that understands how to go global and has a global mindset um, is, is critically important. Number two is making sure that you thoroughly understand your target market, right? So if you're going to go into, so I, you know, if you, and you've been around the world, like if you've done business in, in multiple places around the country, it's a light bulb. It's an epiphany you are in the world. Like you just, all of a sudden you start to learn how to do these things and how different they are and how the same they are, et cetera. But thoroughly understanding your target market is critically important. So for example, um, Japan is usually a great target, uh, Germany, et cetera, right? Uh, Germans and Japanese are very, very different uh, in the way they approach business and think about things and talk about things and what matters to them. And so it's very important for you to understand what those things are. So that as you produce content and experiences, it, it, it matches those needs. Um, so hiring people to understand that and thoroughly understanding your target market, the two most important things. And then thirdly, as you begin to execute, uh, whatever strategy you pick, um, I would start localizing your translation, working your way up the stack and expanding, uh, as you get success. And so typically that would start with, um, Hey, listen, we got to get in, we got to go to, we got to, we've got some, we're getting customers in Germany. We think there's a good market there. How do we do this? Well, one of the first things you want to do is localize your landing pages, right? So the handful of pages where people are going to go. Then you start localizing your marketing communications, right? So emails, Google ads, right? You don't want to have an English Google ad in Japan. That's not going to make any sense, right? So you have to make sure it's um, in, in, in Japanese and, and speaks speaks their language, so, you know, speaks to them in a way that they'll understand will resonate with so marketing communications. Um, number three is most companies as they're being to expand, they've already got customers using um, the product there. So you want to make sure that your help center is localized and that's more content there. And then lastly, or maybe beforely or whatever, depending on how you like to do things, um, localizing your product. And a lot of people kind of save this for last because once you start getting into the actual software product itself, those that can be a little bit more challenging. Um, depending on how you've written the uh, written your particular applications, but that's typically sort of like you know the 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 stack of things that need to be done, and that for each one of those, there's a very there's a cost effective solution to translating and localizing that using uh, artificial intelligence. Incredibly cool! I love everything that you're doing here and how you're leveraging technology to bring people together. But before I let you go, I've got to ask you to leave everyone listening with one final gift, one final piece of wisdom. I always ask my guests to leave everyone listening with either a book for our Amazon wish list that they'd recommend that they check out or a song, Guilty Pleasures Are Allowed, that we can add to our Spotify playlist. All I ask is, which would you like to leave us with and why? Listen, I'm a big fan of you know, any book by Walter Isaacson. You know, I just think him, I just find him to be the most insightful and interesting person, you know, based on his experience talking with so many interesting people. And, and uh, I just finished up with his biography, uh, Leonardo, Leonardo Da Vinci, uh, which I thought was so uh, amazing uh, and remarkable that I recommended it. You know, it's 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 really interesting when you read a book like that in context with like a biography on Steve Jobs or you know Elon Musk or like or whoever, right? It's just like so interesting to watch several hundred years later the similarities uh, that, that that exist with with really truly great innovators. What a great choice! I'll get that added straight to our Amazon wish list, and for anyone listening. Wanting to find out more information about SmartLing, maybe carry on the conversation we started today or just ask 
you or your team a question, where would you like to point everyone? I, I would say just come visit us at spartling.com. We've got a great uh, resource center that's got a, a whole bunch of how-tos and case studies, um, white papers, and that's really one of the best places to come and get a get a uh, a, a bunch of information on globalization. Well, we covered so much in 30 minutes today from the challenges of entering new markets, how AI can help leap over some of those translation hurdles and also how companies can leverage AI-driven translation for localization, scaling up around the world. But I love how you brought it to life with uh, some of those big use cases and how you've helped juggernauts from Canva to Pinterest and so many other reach millions of non-English speaking users. Love what you're doing here with technology. But just a big thank you for shining a light on it today and uh, sharing your story. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. It was a real pleasure to talk with you today. So as we wrap up today's discussion with Brian Murphy, I think it's clear that the landscape of global business is rapidly evolving. But the key takeaway, leveraging AI-driven translation for localization is not just about breaking down language barriers. It's about connecting cultures. It's about expanding global footprints. And I think SmartLink's success is helping in helping brands from Canva to Pinterest reach a diverse global audience. It's testament to the power of innovative technology. I always say technology works best when it brings people together. And I love how what Brian's doing here and creating a more interconnected world. So thank you to Brian for joining us today, sharing his expertise. But this conversation has left me pondering, how will AI continue to transform the way businesses communicate and operate globally? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this one. It's a question far bigger than myself and this humble podcast so let me know techblogwriteroutlook.com twitter linkedin instagram just at neil c hughes let me know your thoughts but that's it for today so one last reminder stay curious embrace the power of technology and until next time let's keep bridging worlds through technology and innovation see you all tomorrow